Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Fairly deep on in the dialogue the Phaedo, there is what appears at first to be just a digression, a sort of breathing space for Socrates where he can gather his forces. He calls in Phaedo, the person who the dialogue is named after, to be his Hercules to his Iolus. Phaedo talks about, you know, the fact that no, Socrates is Hercules. There's a lot of interesting repartee going on there. What's really being talked about is something that is so important that when I teach intro to philosophy classes, I actually include this passage as something that we discuss on the first day of class. So Socrates brings up what he calls the danger of misology. And if you haven't heard that term before, there's good reason for it. It didn't really catch on. Although it is something that's quite prevalent, not, on, not only in our own contemporary culture, but also in the culture of ancient, ancient Greece, ancient Athens, and it's a perennial problem. And Socrates is giving us some insight here into why that's actually the case. So this is a very valuable idea. So he says we can understand misology by way of comparison to misanthropy. If we understand how misanthropy occurs, then we'll understand more or less by the same sort of process how misology occurs. And we'll see some of the same sorts of detriments that result to the person who's caught within it. So what is mis misanthropy? That's a term that we don't use all that frequently, but it is part of our, our uh, vocabulary. And it means something like a hatred or, or distrust of people in general. So a misanthrope is somebody who just doesn't like people, perhaps not even themselves, um, but they, you know, they tend to be a, a loner or they tend to be the kind of person who's stuck with other people and is always sour, never goes out of their way to form friendships or associations. It's coming from the word anthropos, which in Greek means human being. Um, it can mean man, but it can also mean woman, so it's, it's a, a gender neutral term. Um, misology which is a term that Plato is actually coining, which didn't really catch on, means a hatred or distrust of logos. What is logos or logoi is the plural for that? Well, that would be reasoning or account, like when Socrates talks about, I want an account of what uh, the just is or the beautiful or the holy or anything like that. He's talking about a logos of that. Or argument, discussion, really anything that we're doing by means of concepts and words uh, in some sort of more than just shoot from the hip, somewhat systematic way can be a logos. It has other meanings as well, but we don't need to get into all of that because what, what's, what Socrates and what Plato has in mind here is primarily argument or reasoning or account or you might say a, a philosophical perspective on things. So the, mis the misanthrope distrusts people generally. They think that people are no good, and you can't trust any of them. Even if they appear trustworthy, they're going to let you down sooner or later, so better not commit to any of them. The misologist has a similar take towards anything that can be thought of or reasoned out. It's all probably going to fall apart. Uh, don't place your trust in any sort of reasoning process or, or a philosophy or a way of thinking about things because they, they always disappoint you. They're always going to fall short. There is no true uh, perspective that one could have. It's not quite the same thing as relativism, uh, although it could lead to relativism or to, to you know, its, its close cousin of motivism. Uh, and we'll, we'll see why in a moment. 
So now that we've actually looked at what these terms mean, let's look at the process. And Socrates says the same basic process occurs with both of them. So there's something similar going on there. And you can look at this in terms of, of education, in terms of moral education, also in terms of critical thinking. So we start out with a person, we're going to begin with mis, uh, misanthropy to, to make it easy. Start out with a person who is a little bit too trusting. They're, they're kind of naive. They think the better of people than they really ought to. And, you know, we could go into all sorts of psychology of why that's the case. Um, could be because they want to please people. It could be because they're insecure and they're looking for somebody to be their savior. It could be that they just are sort of dumb um, when it comes to people and they're going to be exploited. Um, whatever the reason may be, whatever the, the background is, they all have this in common. They place too much trust indiscriminately in people. It's not based on an understanding of, Socrates will say, human nature. What would an understanding of human nature actually reveal to us? Well, you know, some people are very good. Some people are very bad. The majority of us fall somewhere in between. Some people are more good than bad. Some people are more bad than good, or good in certain respects, bad in certain respects. Some people are kind of smack dab in the middle. Um, and a, a proper understanding of human nature, which we could get from experience, we could get from, you know, perusing literature, we could get from looking at what older people have to say about this sort of thing, people who've lived a lot longer. A proper understanding would say, look, most people are going to be in the middle, which means that you should trust them, but not completely, not absolutely. You should not have complete confidence that they will never let you down, because they will let you down. And so there's going to be some circumstances where they'll walk down the road with you a mile, but they're not going to go two miles. So the person places undue trust in somebody. Could be a parent, could be a teacher, could be a friend, could be a lover. And what happens? They get disappointed. The person turns out to be unreliable. Maybe they not only turn out to be unreliable, but also exploitative or abusive. And now, what do they feel? They feel hurt, they feel disappointed, they probably feel a sense of shame, and there's, there's a possibility for them to do something different at this point. They can think to themselves, what happened here? I, I should reflect on this. But most often, what happens instead is, is a person, when we're hurt, we want to figure out how can I avoid being hurt in the future. So we do a sort of reasoning process about that, not necessarily an explicit reasoning process. And we also jump into other things to try to get away from that feeling of, of being hurt. And the other things that go along with it, fear, shame, um, resentment, all those things that we don't like feeling. So we find a new object of trust. This girlfriend wasn't very good for me. She cheated on me. She, you know, abused my confidence by revealing things that I'd said to other people. She um, didn't care about my feelings. You know, we could go on and on. This, this boss um, just took credit for the work that I did and didn't give me any credit, and I'm left in the lurch. They put all the responsibilities on me. The next one's going to be different. All, all, you know, it's going to be great from now on, because that was an aberration. What? What's going on here? It's the same undue trust. They admitted that there was one exception to the rule that people in general are, are good. Uh, maybe they didn't even understand why that person went wrong, so to speak. And they're operating from, again, a lack of understanding of human nature. And this, can, this process can be repeated as often as we like. Find a new object of trust. This time it's going to work out. The last 20 times the person didn't turn out to be the kind of person I was hoping they'd be, but this one's going to be different. Eventually, we come to a point where that's not going to work anymore. And now there's a shift that takes place. And now we have a general state of mistrust, a, ge a general state of perhaps even hatred, of antagonism, of guardedness, of saying, look, people are no damn good. You can't trust any of them. 
And this could be, you know, with respect to the workplace. This could be with respect to family. This could be with respect to, to lovers. This could be with respect to one's colleagues. Um, there's, there's a lot of different possibilities for this. But the misanthrope in general comes to distrust everybody, to see everybody as a potential threat. Everybody is a potential disappointment. And so what's going to happen because of this? They're going to withdraw from relationships as much as possible. If somebody tries to get close to them, they're going to push them away. Now, how would this play itself out with arguments? Interestingly, Plato is giving you these dialogues that are chock full of arguments. What he's telling you about this, and this accords perfectly well with, with his philosophy, you can't place absolute trust in arguments until they've been, you know, tried and true and you've gone through them. You can't simply extend a kind of confidence in them as if they're going to put everything into perspective, never fail, make sense out of, you know, your, your entire existence. That's too much to demand of an argument or a philosophy or you know, an explanation, whatever it is that we want to, to say, a line of reasoning. There may be some out there that actually can do that, just like there are some people out there who are genuinely good, who won't betray you, or who, you know, there's the, the sort of middle range of the, the good but not completely good, where you can rely on them in most cases, but there's going to be some cases where they're going to fail. It's the same thing for arguments. It's the same thing for, for philosophies. And... Where a person goes wrong is they place absolute confidence in some sort of line of reasoning, some sort of systematic way of articulating things or looking at things. And it's not based on an understanding of, you know, the correspondence, we might say, between the way things actually are and the way in which we're talking about them being, or the way we're thinking about them being, the, the representation that we're, we're making of them in argument, in words. That's going to lead to disappointment. This happens all the time. I see it frequently. Somebody gets into philosophy, or they get into literature, or political theory, or, or sociology, or psychology, or pick whatever you like, and with every single one of them, there is some sort of logos. Actually, there's a lot of logos. And so somebody, you know, becomes a true believer of this Logos. They become a true believer of that Logos. And they think, this actually makes sense out of everything. I can, I can rely on this 100% in every single situation. It will never have exceptions. I finally found my touchstone. I finally found the, the Archimedean point, to use Descartes' metaphor, from which I can move the entire world. And it turns out, no, uh, the point shifts. As it turns out, um, you know, the argument that was going to pick you up at 5 o'clock turns up, you know, 6 o'clock after happy hour having had a few beers. This is the other type of people here, right? But it um, shows the sort of unreliability. So there's disappointment. And then what happens? You know, it could be that the person would actually stop short and say, Maybe I put too much trust in that argument. Maybe I need to be more careful in the future about just how much trust I place in any future arguments, any future relationships I'm going to have with, you know, in the life of the mind or in the sciences or in my discipline. But that doesn't usually happen. What does usually happen? They find a new object of trust. This is why you see um, you know, people who are from a very... Um, closed-minded background, they become liberated and they become just as closed-minded about being liberated. You know, for instance, somebody belongs to a, um, you know, very low church, don't think about anything, just, you know, read the Bible sort of background, and what do they do? They become a fundamentalist of secularism. They become a evangelical of atheism, and they refuse to hear any, any other possible ways of thinking about it. Why? Because there's this emotional commitment going on. Um, you see people swing the other extreme, too. You know, they, they didn't like where they were before, and the, the, the secular things that they placed trust in didn't 
didn't follow through, they didn't make good on it. So then they swing way over to some other quite radical uh, point of view. And that's probably going to let them down as well, because it's, it's probably not a very good Logos that they're jumping into. Could actually be a good Logos in some cases, just the person makes such a botch of it that they're not actually, what's in their head is a, you know, a different Logos than the one that they are invited to participate in. In any case, there's a disappointment that takes place. There's a new object of trust, and this can occur several times. You know, forget Plato, I'm going to be an Aristotelian. Aristotle has all the answers. And then you find out, well, no, Aristotle doesn't have all the answers. Screw both of them, I'm going to be a Stoic. Well, at a certain point, you probably want to become more realistic about your expectations, about what it is that arguments can actually do for us. You probably want to look at the philosophers who have some degree, not necessarily of skepticism, but of circumspection towards arguments like Plato or Aristotle, uh, so that you don't fall into a general state of mistrust and say, no arguments are any good, because here's the problem. You're going to have to believe in something. You're going to have to think about something. Even if you are purely passive and you get those ideas from somebody else, you're going to end up you know, having some way that you think about things, some way that you run your life, some way that you organize the world of your experience, your relationships. So if you totally mistrust any of the arguments that are out there, well, you'll, you'll find another one that you don't realize is an argument, and it will articulate things for you. There's one other thing I do want to say about this interesting problem of mythology. Plato points out that those, there's another group of people besides those who go through this process of trust, betrayal, um, retribution, mistrust, jumping back in, and eventual you know, general mistrust of everything. He talks about those who spend a lot of their time or make a living making arguments on both sides. And he says that there's a danger for them of thinking that they're better than the arguments because the arguments basically serve them, they're tools for them. This is a danger inherent in rhetoric, inherent in politics, inherent in, in ethics to some degree. You know, when I teach, I teach you know, Kant and then the next uh, session maybe I'm teaching Aristotle and I'm teaching them both as if they could possibly be true. Uh, I do think both of them have some true things in them. Um, but I could do it in a sophistical way. So Socrates thinks that people who are doing this for a living are particularly prone to another kind of mythology where it's not so much distrust of the arguments, they're not going to let an argument um, you know, run the show, but it's just the self that ends up being the thing that's asserted. Whatever my perspective happens to be at the moment, that will determine which arguments I actually use. And I'll only trust them as far as I need to. It's sort of like being a tyrant and having a bunch of servants to, to attend to your needs. You're not actually going to trust those servants any further than you need to. Either of those cases, there's going to be a problem. What is it? Well, if there are any true arguments out there, if there are any that we actually should trust, that it does make sense to rely upon, if you have the stance that we shouldn't trust any of them, you're not going to find them when they're there. You're not going to try them out. Think of it in terms of misanthropy and relationships. You could think of it in terms of possible romantic interest, or you could think about it in terms of a friendship or a good colleague, if you don't actually extend yourself and engage back and forth and, and exhibit some level of trust, you can't have any trust growing. You can't have the kind of experiences which would lead you to say, well, this person actually is sincere. I actually do want to be involved with this person. So likewise with arguments, if, if you're a misologist, you're not going to be able to commit yourself to anything. You can't do the imaginative work to, to try on Plato's perspective and see whether there's anything to it, or try on Aristotle's perspective, or try on Nietzsche's perspective for that matter. Because you'll always be saying, stay back, I'm only going to trust you as far as I can throw you, or see, or, you know, 
put you into some sort of schema. And if that's the case, then you are probably never going to understand the arguments. So this is a real serious danger that he's cautioning us about.